You guys good? You guys doing well? All right, I love that. I, uh, I uh, don't feel great physically right now. And uh, I told this to the four. I was like, this is like a, a message that is like shoutable, that I want to shout, and I just can't do that today. And uh, I was joking, like, you, you're probably like that. Like, when did the shouting thing become a thing? Like, we don't like that. Like, talking is sometimes like, uh, like, and maybe it's good because of the content today. I don't want shouting to take away from these words um, because I feel like this is straight from heaven, man. I really do. And so maybe this will just be a conversation and maybe that's great. Um, but you guys are happy to be in church? You yeah. look good. I like that. Uh, no such thing as a normal Sunday. And we say that because um, if God is indescribable and if God cannot be exaggerated and if Jesus is back from the dead and if this whole thing is real and all of us are here because we know in our knowers that it is, then really there's no such thing as a normal Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or any day, right? Like any temporary moment, God could change somebody's eternity. And that's true for right now. And therefore, there is no such thing as a normal Sunday. And right now, man, I, uh, we're busy. We have busy lives, and it's a loud world. And uh, I want to do this. God is always present. You believe that? He's here right now. Um, the human condition means that most of the time we aren't you know, um, because we're, we're in our phones or in our to-do lists somewhere else or we're in tomorrow worrying about it or we're in our past uh, regretting something. But God is right here and right now. And, and most of the time when we don't experience him, it's not because he didn't show up. It's because our God awareness is low. <laughs> and so I want to press pause and I just want to fix our focus and shut out distractions on purpose right now because he's here um, but you get the feeling he likes to be invited, even though he's already here. And I don't want us to miss these moments. Amen? Yeah. All right, would you bow your heads and, and close your eyes just to focus. Deep breath right now, in through the nose, out through the mouth. That's what they say you should do. You don't get to do that very often. God, we love you. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would... Heighten our God senses to be aware of just how real and present you are. We love you so much, and I pray that you'd speak to us in a new way today. We pray this in the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. amen. That felt good. It just felt good. Um, where are my travelers at in the room? Who likes to travel? Who wishes they had money so they could go travel? That's me. That's me also. Here is like my favorite question to ask right here. It's because it's fun. If you could go anywhere, like say you had an all expenses paid, um, 10 day trip, first class to any place on the planet, where would you go? Tell your neighbor right now, anywhere. And don't say like, oh, mission trip. <laughs> we don't need you to be a hero in this game of a hypothetical vacation, thank you. All right, now look under your chairs for the golden ticket. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right, shout them out. Who's got one? Where, where would you go? Rome. New Zealand. New Zealand. I like it's on my list. New Zealand, the Maldives, Santorini, Greece. There are no wrong answers. We're all winners. Not of a free vacation, but in life, which I think is more meaningful. That's good. It is good. Thank you, Sam. Here's another question. What, what, what's better? And, and think about this. What's better? Traveling or coming home? Oh, that's good too. I, for me, it used to be traveling. And now I think I actually like coming home more than I like traveling. Maybe it's because I'm now 30 and uh, I now have gray hair. I know you didn't notice that. And I have a wife and I have a son. But I think I legit like coming home more than I like leaving and I don't know like there's studies that actually show that um, home is like good for you right like home is where your stuff is you don't have to be on at home right like home is where you can put on your sweats crash on the couch and watch Netflix and down an entire pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream and nobody can say nothing because you're home it's your home right got really passionate about that <laughs> 
Your body, like, needs a home. Here's the thing. So does your soul. Now we're getting spiritual. See this transition right here? Here's my question for you. Are you internally at home? I feel like you, can, you, you know when you are. Or are you internally nomadic? Now, my generation, most of us, millennials, we are known as the nomadic generation. I think it's a strength. I also think it's a weakness. Um, because I think sometimes we can feel like this pervasive like homesickness and discontentment inside of us. And we think, I, like, my problem is my geographical location, right? I just need to go to, to New York, man, or Africa. I just need like the, the next season, the next job. But the problem is, is that it has far more to do with your soul in your soul's spiritual location than it has to do with your body in your physical location, right? Because if you're, if you're homesick here, you will be homesick there. Like, if your soul is homesick here, your soul will be homesick there. Does that make sense? This is why the Apostle Paul could, could feel content in a mansion or a prison cell. Why? Because his soul was, his soul was home. Where does your soul go to go home? Where, where does your soul go to have a home-cooked meal. The uh, prodigal son story in Luke 15 is where we're going to be, and um, this is the story of two souls coming home. We have the younger son, the prodigal son, and he leaves and goes to the distant country. The older son stays and works in the fields, but both souls are homesick, and I'm going to show you that. And so apparently, you can be like externally home, but not internally. Apparently, you can be home, but not really be home, right? You can be home, but you can always be more home, okay? And so we've all heard the story of the prodigal son. We, we, uh, we read it, and we see the younger son coming home as, like, something that you do one time in your life. And it's like, it's like salvation. It's a picture of salvation. And while that is absolutely true, what I want to I show you today, man, I believe with all my heart, that is the first layer of what might be the most layered story of all time. Today I want to show you the next layer, and it's this invitation that this story gives to you as a Christian to come home and come home again and come home again and stay home. And so if you're taking notes, we'll just call this message Homesick Souls. And we'll go straight to Luke 15. This is straight from the divine imagination of Jesus. He is the storyteller, okay? Mark Twain said, this is the greatest story that's ever been told. Shakespeare wrote plays about this story, the prodigal son. Here we go. Uh, This is 15. I think it starts in verse 11. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. And so I guarantee you already Jesus' audience is is like sucking air. (gasps) Like, this is ridiculous. Like, my voice, like, clogged, and I tried to do that, and you just heard that. I was like, that was going to be funny, but then it ended up being more funny, so you're welcome. Because two ridiculous things have already happened, and we're two verses into the story. First, like, this is basically the younger son telling his dad, Dad, I wish you were dead. That's basically, like, he's asking for his inheritance, his inheritance early. And, like, an ancient Middle Eastern dad would have been expected to physically punish this kid and then kick him out of the house. But he doesn't do that. And here's the second ridiculous thing. He actually agrees and says, yes, the father gives him his inheritance early, which is crazy because, and, and here's the thing, like, there was an older son and a younger son. Traditionally, the older son would get two-thirds of the estate and the younger son would get the other third of the estate, okay? So now, like, the the Greek word there for estate is the word bios, B-I-O-S, and it means this, that by which life is sustained. And so, really, this means the father divided his life. Why? Because in order to give the son his inheritance... Um, he, like his money wasn't in the bank account, it was in his land, and his land was his worth. It was his value, his estate, his life, his bios. He does not just lose a son, he loses part of himself. This is costly for the father. So not long after this, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant 
country. Remember that phrase right there, distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. This right here is the younger son narrative, the prodigal son narrative. You could say it this way, self-discovery apart from the father. How familiar, by the way, does that sound in 2019? 150 people a week, you guys, move to Austin. And I don't know the answer to this question, but I wonder all the time, how many, how many are trying to, to find themselves and live their truth apart from God, right? I'll, I'll find myself, I'll, I'll find happy, like I'll live my truth and I don't need God to do it. I'll make, I'll make my way. And if you pay attention Like, it it works until it doesn't. It really does. Until you run out of resources, until you have to find yet another new location. And if you pay attention, this is starting to happen right now. Like, in the West, on a massive scale, but especially in cities like the city that we live in. The secular salvation narrative that you can find a home for your soul without God is failing in front of our faces right now. A tide is shifting, and this is why, man, you watch. Over the next decade, Jesus will start to become intriguing and more beautiful to people who never thought in a million years that he would. You watch, man. I'm telling you, the tide is coming in. Let's keep going. After he spent everything, exhausted his resources, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country. Cultural context to remember, uh, this is a Jew hiring himself out to a Gentile, which back in the day, Jews did not do, right? Right? And this guy sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. The easiest way I can think to say this is pigs are basically illegal to Jews, right? And he, like, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. He was in a pigsty, a literal pigsty, but nobody gave him anything. And his journey of self-discovery apart from his father is leaving him in a place where he has completely forgotten who he is, right? And I'm reading this, and I'm like, is this Lion King? Like, is this Mufasa up in the clouds talking to Simba? Like, Simba, you have forgotten me. No, how could I? You have forgotten who you are. And so, I know I sound exactly like James Earl Jones, right? And my hair's not gray, and I'm very self-aware. Here's one of the best lines ever. The next one, here it is. The younger son, when he came to his senses... Some translations say when he came to the end of himself. Sometimes God in his infinite goodness will let you come to the end of yourself because then and only then will you come home and come home to stay. And he says to himself, man, I'm going to go back to dad's house. Like, this is ridiculous. I'm going to go back. I'll, I'll see if I can get a job and be an employee. I can't be a son anymore. That ship has sailed. He's, he's logical. He's smart. He knows that's no longer an option. So he's like, I'll go. I'll get a job. At least then I'll have a warm bed to sleep in, right? And he prepares a, a, a speech, a pretty pathetic one. We've all done this in high school, driving home after curfew in trouble. He prepares a speech. He heads back. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And so he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And then the son starts his speech right here. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Right? Who talks like this? Only people who make speeches. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He thought he was a child by worth. You're a child by birth, not worth. And that's free. It even rhymes for you, right? I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, notice Jesus is the storyteller in this story. And the story Jesus is telling has the father completely ignoring this kid's speech. And the father says, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Go get a ring and put it on his finger and sandals for his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it because we're going to party. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine who was dead is now alive again. He was lost and he is now found. And they begin to, they begin to celebrate. And if you're new here, this is the heartbeat of our church. That, that, that parties are part of heaven's culture. And, and, and heaven throws 
throws a party every single time a prodigal comes home. And every Sunday, to the best that we can, that's, that's what we try to do here. And no doubt, everybody in Jesus' audience is either confused or furious about this ridiculous story. Sitting there listening, thinking like, okay, like, fictitious father in Jesus' made-up story, like, can I remind you, like, your kid basically wished that you were dead and then took your hard-earned money and squandered all of it and, and we're, we're throwing a party in his honor? Like, he gets a robe that represents righteousness and cleanliness when he is neither of those things? He gets a, a ring that represents covenant? He gets the fattened calf that you were saving for a special occasion? Like, what did, like, did I miss something? Is this a, is he a, a faithful soldier returning from war like a hero, or is he a screw-up? Because I'm reading this, he's, he's a screw-up, and we're throwing him a party. Now, what we see right here is the illogical and, quite frankly, scandalous good news that is our gospel, that you and I get what we do not deserve, right? Like, you can't fluster the big man upstairs with your mess. You now have an option to come home because his, like, your sin is simply no longer a problem for Jesus. He is not in love with the future version of you that has all your stuff figured out. Jesus, God, right now is in love with the broken, stressed out, messed up, selfish, addicted, self-righteous, anxious, depressed, legalistic, licentious, suicidal, anxious, Divorced, drunk, high, angry, bitter, lonely version of yourself that you might be right now. That's who Jesus loves. And like God can handle you. And the story of the prodigal son is kind of Jesus, he's the storyteller, is kind of like his grand declaration to the universe. Not only that like you and I are messed up, but that he's not. Like, he just completely outed us in this story. Bam, everybody's a bum. You're all in this together, and I'm awesome, and I'm the Savior. <laughs> Your sin is not a problem for me. My grace is big, and God does not make you pay for your sin. How do I know that? Because the storyteller already paid for it. So now you come home, and heaven throws you a party, and this is a picture of salvation, but what about when you come home and welcome to being a Christian and a human being at the same time? What about when you get saved and you come home, but you still act and feel and think like you're not? What happens when you come home, but the distant country still calls? Well, you have two choices in that moment. Number one, you pretend to be better than you really are. You learn Christianese really quickly. When people ask you, hey, man, hey, man, how you doing? Oh, good, God is good, even though <laughs> your life's falling apart. You look good without being good. This is a very popular option for Christians, right? It's the tempting option. Or number two, option number two, you peel back the first layer of salvation from this story, and now you find yourself in the second layer called sanctification, trusting that no matter how home you currently are, you can always be more home. Trusting that God's grace has got you, and while that's not a license for you to go and sin, if you think that, you don't understand the gospel. While it's not a license, you can wander off a million more times and you will be welcomed back home a million and one more times. And so for those of us who, who get saved, let's just have some real talk. If you got saved in like your young adult years, which was me, it's my story, it's Ryan's story, it's Ethan's story. Um, there's like this weirdly complicated journey that we take out of the party scene. And I'm going to go there because I've been there. I'm going to go there and we're going to talk real. Because I've had, I've had so many conversations, like specifically over the past five years, and I used to be on the other side of this table, and now I find myself in the pastor position, which is so weird to me. But um, I, I would have conversations with guys who go like, well, Jesus would be in the bar. He'd be in the club. 
in the world, not of the world, bro. That's where Jesus would be, so that's where I'm at. And I go, okay. Like, that's true. I'll give you that. Uh, that, that is where Jesus would be. And then every time he'd go there, he would do miracles or find every lonely person in the building or save everybody. And then I wonder which of those three you did last night. <laughs> or really, is that just your brilliant way of justifying something and stamping the name Jesus on it, right? And, and just to be clear, like, I'm not talking um, a couple drinks at happy hour with your friends. I, like, I, I don't think Jesus would be mad at that. Like, I don't think you can argue that with any sort of biblical integrity or fidelity. In fact, I, like, he's for community, all right? So I'll go on the record saying that. But I am talking about, I am, follow me, and to quote the Bible, let's just be real, drunkenness, lust, sexual immorality, debauchery, and it begs the question, like, if it's fun at night, but then it's not fun the next day, like, both in, not, not just in your body, but, like, in, in your soul, is that, then is that really fun? Or is that, like, some weird form of self-inflicted torture? Like a loop of self-torture that you would never call it that. Here's the funny thing, like, you, you get saved and you come home, and what you'll start to notice is sin that used to be fun is now no longer fun. And it's frustrating to you <laughs> because you're like trying to find like the same satisfaction and the same fun that you used to find in all of that. And you're like, it's not working and it's driving me crazy, right? And why? Why is that? Because now you know what it's like to be home. So now you're comparing it to something, right? I'll, I'll rework that C.S. Lewis quote. Making mud pies in a slum is a good old time. It really is. As long as you remain ignorant to what is meant by a Royal Caribbean holiday at sea. And now, I've been home, and sin that used to be fun now puts like this metallic taste in my mouth. And it's frustrating, but it's also amazing because that's the beginning of your invitation into something more. That might be signs that I'm at the end of me and where I end, God starts, and that's good news. So how do you get better? Like, we'll, we'll say this, and then we'll move on to the, to the older son. If, like, if, if, if you just, like, man, I'm, I am the younger son through and through, and even now that I've come home, I, like, I still am the younger son, like, daily and weekly. Okay, that, like, so how do I get better at coming home and staying home if that's me? And here's my answer for you. When you sin again, and you will, the most powerful place that you can be, the second after you mess up, is home enjoying the scandalous love of God. All right? So by observing yourself in the immediate aftermath of a royal screw-up, <laughs> you can understand how much do I, un like, you'll gauge how much do I understand the gospel. Because if you mess up and then you hesitate for even a second to run back to your father, you still need more revelation as to exactly how good he is. And the more time you spend home, the more that will sink into your soul and become part of you. I wish we could keep going, but let's move on. We have another brother, and it's about to get more ridiculous because we have an older brother who did not leave. In fact, for years, he's been out in the field doing what a good son does. And here's what happens. When he came near the house, this is the older brother. So at this point, the, the younger brother's home. They're inside partying. And you have to feel for the older brother right here. He came near the house. He heard music and dancing. <laughs> so I'm like, man, this poor kid, like, he is, in all of Luke 15, he is the only logical character that we have. And he's been out in the fields working all day, probably calloused hands and, like, blisters on his feet. And he, like, nobody came to get him. <laughs> and he's walking back to the house, and he, he hears, like, gleeful cheering and laughing and music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked him, what, like, what's going on? And the servant said, your brother has come home, he replied, and your father killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused 
to go in. So his father went out. I love this about the father. The father went out and pleaded with his older son. But he answered, look. He answered back to his dad, look. All these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, he won't even call him by name, his little bro. He says, Dad, when this son of yours who squandered your property and your money on prostitutes comes home, you kill a fattened calf for him, the one that we were saving for a special occasion? And if you, like... If the younger brother's conflict is self-discovery apart from the father, the older brother's conflict is moral conformity apart from the father. Earning and deserving affection and status from God. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had, we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is now alive again. He was lost and he is now found, right? Now the older brother sins, the older brother has sins, and let's, let's be real. They're far more socially acceptable than the younger brother's sin, all right? It doesn't mean they're acceptable, but far more socially acceptable, absolutely. Tim Keller, like, he, like he, I read this in one of his books, and I was like, oh my gosh, that is so real, and I couldn't believe it at the same time. He said, the older brother was actually farther alienated from the father than the younger brother was, because the older brother had no idea that he was in trouble and in need of his father, while the younger son absolutely did. It had nothing to do with geography, and everything to do with where is my soul. The brother was home working, but he wasn't really home. And because of that, he got angry, bitter, resentful, because he did not get what he thought he earned. Check out this quote by Henry Nouwen. Anger, resentment, jealousy, notice none of us are off the hook here. Desire for revenge, lust, greed, antagonisms and rivalries are obvious signs that I have left home. And that happens quite easily. And this is post-salvation. When I pay careful attention to what goes on in my mind from moment to moment, I come to the very disconcerting discovery that there are very few moments during my day that I am really free from these dark emotions, passions, and feelings, right? So here we go. Experiencing rejection is not a sin. Of course not. But rejection is 100% a voice that can beckon you to leave home and journey to a distant country called self-pity. And that is sin. Failure is not a sin. It's actually one of like the best teachers and sometimes the best thing that can happen to you. But like let's be honest, it is a voice that calls you to leave home to a distant country called inward defeatism, which is just pride. Wanting to like achieve and be successful and be influential, not a sin. Actually, probably God-given and, and amazing. But let's be honest, voices that beckon, and if you find yourself in a space where you are constantly daydreaming about being famous, rich, and powerful, I would say, you're home, but you could be more home, you know? Social media is not a sin, but you cannot tell me that it's not a voice that calls you away from home to a distant country called comparison. So you wake up in the morning, and the first thing you do is Instagram before you even check in with, with God, right? And before you know it, like subtly, you're just like, you're like, you're like, why am I sad and like mad and jealous and insecure? And it's not even three minutes into my day and I've already lost. <laughs> because those are my voices I hear before I hear the voice of my father. The father's voice makes you calm, secure, and confident. I was thinking like, what, like, what are some more examples of like, Younger brothers who come home and, and then begin to, like, fall into stumbling patterns that represent the older brother. It's very, it's like, a, it's Christian, guys, is what it is. We're all in this, okay? 
And I'm, I'll say this because I've been here so many times, and so has Ryan, okay? Um, it's like you get saved, and then, like, you get into the church world, and you're home, and you start to get a pretty good grasp on, like, a couple books in the Bible, right? And I'm learning stuff here, and I'm learning stuff there, and, and, uh, and then, here, like, here's what can happen, and all that's great, but here's what can sometimes happen, and here's a, a, a yellow flag to watch out for. Um, you'll learn something new and important about theology or God or the Bible or the church or um, like a current event and, and how like this all intertwines. To, like, in, like maybe from a podcast or from a seminary class or from a sermon or a book. And you get really passionate about it and that is great. And that's from God. But there'll be times, and, and it's just you and God, between you and him, you'll notice you, you start to sometimes feel mad at other Christians for not knowing this very important thing that you learned three days ago. And you start to venture into older brother territory, right? And so I'm like, man, so what do you do if to watch these older brother sin patterns. It's like, okay, watch what the older brother in this story does and, and do the opposite. <laughs> so this, this older brother, he's angry and bitter, angry and bitter and self-righteous and resents his younger brother and resents his father. What he, should have gone, like, what he should have done is gone straight to the father to talk to him about it, but instead he goes to the servants to talk to the servants about how mad he is at the Father. So, if you're bitter and angry about something, that's human. And God knows anyways. And I feel like those moments where I finally like go to him and I let off my steam to God and I get mad at him and I tell him about my resentment, I, I, I've had a lot of those special moments where I feel like he finally goes, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, thank God we can finally get real. And you're not speaking Christianese to me. I know it's in there. I can handle it. Like, I don't want it in there. You got it out. Good. What we often do, and, and here's, you have to watch this. Like, we'll take our anger and bitterness, and we'll go talk to these Christians who are also angry and bitter, and we'll all be angry and bitter together about those Christians or those people. And what, what's the fruit of that? Division. What's the heart of the Father? Unity. <laughs> you bring it to the Father before anybody else. And if you need to release it somewhere... He, like, he's saying the invitation's here. Like, the, young, the older son, like, snapped at the father. We just read it. And still the father kept, like, entreating him. Okay, like, keep, like, come inside. Please come inside. Oh, I love you. Everything I have is yours. I love you so much. Look, dad. Oh, come inside, come inside. Like, that's the heart of our father. And, Ben, you can come up. We'll end here. There's a pastor named Judah Smith. A lot of you guys might know who he is. He pastors a church in Seattle. And I would, like, unbiasedly make the claim that he might be the, the best communicator on planet Earth right now. And not just ab about the Bible, just in general. And he preaches in stadiums full of tens of thousands of people. And I was, I was listening to an interview where somebody was asking him, so, like, do you get nervous for that? And he said, honestly, like, I have a lot of, like, faults in my life, but, I, like, no, I don't. I don't get nervous for that. And the person interviewing him said, how is that possible to not be nervous for something like that? And he, he said this, and I love this. He said, you know, when I was growing up, I was in a home where every single day my father told me, Judah, people like you? and they want to hear what you have to say. And the next day, Judah, people like you, and they want to hear what you have to say. And the next day, Judah, and I'm starting to do this to my son, Will, now. He doesn't even understand because he's eight months old. But I'm like, Will, like, people like you, and they want to hear what you have to say. And he said, so now I'm 40 years old, and whether I'm speaking to 10,000 people or I'm in any social setting. I just believe, whether it's true or not, 
that people like me and they want to hear what I have to say. Like, can you imagine walking into church, walking into anything on a Friday night, walking into your classroom, your place of work, and like believing that in your heart of hearts, no insecurity, people like me, and they want to hear what I have to say? That is the voice that you get from a father when your soul is home. And the more you're around it and the more you hear it, eventually you will actually start to believe it about yourself. Right? So you're home, but you could be more home. You're home, but you could always be more home. You get the Father's voice there. Other, like, that's the other thing that you get besides the most amazing party ever that happens to last forever, is the voice of this Father. And the more you practice the disciplined art, those two words, disciplined art of coming home and staying home and coming home and staying home the more you hear that voice and the more you'll begin to feel whole and complete like somewhere internally you're no longer nomadic and you can feel at home like in Austin in New York in Cape Town in that season in this season why because your soul is home your soul's home so Luke 15 the greatest chapter in the Bible in my opinion Jesus actually tells three stories. This is the third one. Um, he starts by telling, the first story he talks about the shepherd who has a hundred sheep and like one of the sheep wanders off because that's what sheep do and the shepherd leaves the 99 to go find that one sheep. The next story, this lady has like a ton of silver coins. She loses one of them and she flips her entire house upside down to find one lost silver coin. In this third story, a father loses a son, but nobody goes to look for him. It's a head scratcher. Makes you ask why, and that's the point. Tim Keller in his book, Prodigal God, writes, it's because Jesus, the storyteller, is getting us to ask the question, who should have gone? Somebody should have. Who? Who was it? Who should have gone? Jesus is telling this story on purpose with every detail, and he wants us to find ourselves in this story and miss something and long for something and need something more, right? Now remember, we have two brothers in this story. Everybody in that day and age in that culture would know the older brother got the lion's share of the estate and of the dad's inheritance for a reason. Because as the older brother, it was his job to keep the estate together and to keep the family together. Which means a good older brother would have gone to his dad and said, Dad, my younger brother is lost. I'm leaving to go find him and bring him back regardless of what it costs, no matter how expensive it is for me. That's what he should have done, but that is not what he did. The younger son needed a good older brother, but what he got was a self-righteous one instead. So you and me, us, the collective human race of prodigals who are far from God, need a true older brother. Jesus is creatively entreating us to read into this story a third brother. There is one, you guys, who did it right. There is one who loved God and loved people perfectly and selflessly. There is one who did earn every, like there's one who actually earned the robe of righteousness and cleanliness. There is one who earned the ring of covenant. There is one who deserved that party. There is one, but he did not get any of those things. If you remember, instead of a, a robe, he was stripped naked. Instead of a ring of honor, he got a crown of thorns. Instead of um, a party and a dinner, he got vinegar. And this true older brother then turns to us and says, you couldn't get the robe and you couldn't get the ring and you couldn't get the dinner unless I earned them and then willingly lost they're mine, but I give them to you. Jesus put a bad older brother in this story 
to make us long for a good one. Not for the one we deserve, we get that, but for the one that we need. Not just a brother who would go to the next town to find us and bring us home, but a brother who would leave heaven and come to earth to get us and bring us home. Not just a brother who would do this at the expense of his bank account, the cost of his bank account, but a brother who would do this at the cost of his very life, right? To pay the price for my wrongdoings when I'm the younger brother, which is often, and to pay the price for my self-righteousness when I'm the older brother, which is often a real older brother, a true older brother who paid the infinite price to make a way for us to come home and then to come home again and then to come home again and again and again and again and again. This is the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God in that song that we love to sing about. The one who chases us down and fights until we're found and leaves 99 sheep to go after the one that's missing and flips an entire house and all the furniture upside down to find one missing coin and gives you the ring of covenant and a robe of righteousness and the greatest party that you've ever heard of. There is nothing that stops this God and his unconditional, ridiculously illogical, scandalous, and dare I say it, prodigal love that he has towards you. Romans 8 would say nothing stands between you and Jesus, not height or depth or death or life or angels or demons or heaven or hell. Nothing stands between you and the love of Christ Jesus, our Lord, our God, and our true older brother, amen. Would you guys stand? Stand and if you don't mind, close your eyes. I want to pray and I just feel like um, we need to come home more and I feel like there, there's this is such a loud world with so many voices but there is one voice of truth that we find at home that drowns out all of the others and, and oftentimes we are so deaf to it, not because he's not present, but because we're not. And, and right now, I just want you to breathe and shut out distraction and imagine what this father would say to you if you were physically at a dinner table with him, home, a home-cooked meal in heaven. And I picture him explaining to you exactly how loved you are and how he nailed it when he created you, that he doesn't make mistakes, that he has plans and a purpose for you, that you are chosen before the creation of anything. You were chosen and known by him and knit together in your mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully made, and that you are favored and that he has blessing to pour out on your life. And if there's blessing that somebody else in your life gets, a promotion, a raise, a ring, <laughs> it's not like there's a finite amount of blessings that he has in heaven to divvy out to people. There is an infinite amount. And he is saying, oh, oh my gosh, I have so much to bless you with. Remain home, remain home. People like you. You, not the person, like people like you and they want to hear what you have to say. At this church, we like you and we need you. We want to hear what you have to say. We want you to use your gifts, your God-given talents and treasures. In this community, you're wanted here. You are chosen. And no matter how home you are, you will always be able to be more home. Lean into him right now for this part of worship. I pray you feel home. No matter how much of God you think you know, there is more, I promise you. He's God. He's an infinite well of everything that is good. So if you feel a holy discontentment in your heart, like there's more, that's given to you by God to lean into him and to never stop seeking him and to never stop knocking and to never stop coming home and to never stop staying home. 
you could wander and you will be welcomed back with a party every single time but the life you so long for is not found in the distant country you've been there you've seen for yourself don't follow the voices they call but there is one voice that beckons you to stay to stay to stay home so God would you speak to us during this song during this during this 15 minutes God I pray in the name of Jesus that shame would be gone I pray in the name of Jesus that restlessness would be gone and this idea that I, I need to be somewhere else doing something else right now, that would be gone in the name of Jesus. We, we have to be one place, and it's right here, right now, home with you, God. There, there's no better place to be, nothing more important than your voice. So shut out distractions, calm our restless hearts, and let us feel internally just how home our souls are. We love you so much. We pray this in the powerful name of the true older brother, Jesus Christ.